what we did was we brought standards to it, insurance, 24-7 support. We made sure the houses were visited and not everybody makes it to the hosting of a student. Hi everyone, welcome to Now Boarding, a new travel podcast by me, Payal Nair. Hi everyone, thank you for joining in again. Um, Today I'm in conversation with David Bycroft. David is the founder of the Australian Homestay Network and I think he's based out of Brisbane, but I'm sure he's, okay, he's nodding his head, which means he is, thank you. Um, And so I'm I'm really excited to be talking to David today. Um, What I understand is that in 2012, um, um, he was able to, he, I think he worked along with the immigration department in Australia and was able to get um, quite a few of the asylum seekers out of the detention centers into homestays. And um, that was like, that was incredible work and must have been hard work as well. And um, today, um, you know, cut to whatever, 10 years, <laughs> 10 years hence, um, he's actually working towards, um, you know, helping students who have been impacted by the pandemic in the international students um, in Australia. And he's helping and supporting them into homestays. So that's, um, you know, that must be a very fascinating journey as well. But thank you so much, uh, David, for being a part of Now Boarding. And uh, I can't wait to, to hear it from you. Thanks, Payal. So we, we actually started the Australian Homestay Network back in 2007, and we placed our first international student in 2008. And, and little did we know what was going to happen next. It just grew. Um, so we're Australia-wide. We've got, uh, we get 500 host applications every month from people who just want to house an international student. But our international student journey got us into um, seeing that hosts were so good at looking after people in their own homes and, um, you know, reveled in it. When there was a problem with um, the boat people, we called them arriving in Australia and being put in overcrowded detention centres, we went to the government and said, we think we could put them in Australian homes. Um, And we think that there would be enough Australians respond to it, that it would ease the pressure on detention centres, but it would also be a much more economic and cheaper uh, solution and better solution than having them in detention centres. Are there other countries who um, have a similar kind of a network? Yeah, look, Homestay, why we went into Homestay was that it was very much a boutique ad hoc, uh, no rules, no regulations industry. So what we did was we brought standards to it, insurance, 24-7 support. We made sure the houses were visited and not everybody makes it to the hosting of a student. Um, So we, we actually lifted the bar very high. And around the world, most of our... um, Um, peers have also lifted the bar to our standards now, which is pleasing to see, including here in Australia. Um, So it is a common form of accommodation, but it's one that's underutilised. And when you consider that that international students are going to continue to grow and want to study in another country, accommodation is sometimes, you know, the second biggest cost they have by far. Education's first and then accommodation. So if we can get them in reasonably priced, including meals, give them a network family to live with, it's much better for the student. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, So what kind of a criteria, you said that you, you know, you really lifted the bar um, high with your screening process. So what kind of uh, a criteria do you have? I mean, obviously not all of it, but some of the highlights, uh, which would be interesting to, to hear about. We we were the first ones to introduce a proper homestay management system. We used technology to help 
uh, load all the data in from both host and guest or student and making sure that we had um, a, a way we could scale the vast numbers of pieces of information and the different people putting information in so that we could make rational decisions based on fact and not just gut feel. And that worked really well for us. So having a, a system that both agents and education providers and parents, hosts and students could all log into, it's all transparent. So bringing transparency was very important to, to making sure that we had a successful outcome. Um, but there are other standards, like we have the world's best um, insurance program for liability because accidents can happen and things do go wrong sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So we have a really, really nice insurance program. And we visit the homes. Like we have somebody in each of the cities that visits the home. And our, our general uh, guide is if you don't want your child staying there, we don't want our students staying there. Yeah. Um, so that's how we try to get the feeling of friendliness, of support, of positiveness. You know, we, we want to be placing in a, in a successful and happy environment. So a lot, lot of standards around uh, quality and assurances. So do you, um, so once the uh, profile of the potential student and, um, and, you know, and the homestay host is um, in the system, do you try and somehow, you know, um, I mean, it's hard to match personalities, but do you try and um through experience you know your your colleagues figure out okay maybe the student will fit in or this this particular student or this host family may not work for a particular student do you kind of also have that kind of a process in place yeah, so, so the system shortlists the possible hosts for and it takes in a, a number of criteria including location because we know where the student is studying so we've got to try to find somebody you know reasonably close by public transport to the education provider but we don't let the system make the decision we always make sure there's a human who who is looking at everything and making the final decision on the placement because our managers know their hosts they know what types of issues they've had before and they know what sort of um, challenges they might have. So we, we always try to make sure the decision's not necessarily made by a machine, but, but right. the top five might be made by the machine. And then our managers go through and make sure they pick the right one. Um, in terms of uh, the pricing, do you have any kind of a... Uh, price point? Um, is it based on location? Is it, you know, is it based on the, the space that's provided um, to the student? Uh, what, what kind of criteria do you have for that? So, so it's not based on the size of the room or the home or the space. Okay. We, we, we try to standardize the pricing by city um, because we, we want to always stay very competitive with rental, room rental and um, you know, house rental. And as you know from um, the economy in Australia and other, other countries, rental prices have gone up, yeah. while, while homestay prices will stay relatively flat. So that we will get a gap between us and uh, rental prices, which will suit um, the students better. And we have different packages. We can have no meals, one meal a day, two meals a day, three meals a day. So prices would vary depending on how many meals, which city you're in. Um, we have not yet done um, territorial in the city different prices. So we've kept loyal to one price per city. Um, we, we have not yet um, put prices up where you're next door to the university you want to go to. Um, <laughs> but, but down the track, we may have to do that because supply demand drives everything. And hosts, you know, have the right, if they live right next to one of the major universities, they can get more money in private rental. Um, so that we, we, we will have to look at that. But right now we've stayed loyal to just making it simple, easy to understand, one price uh, per region and different packages you know the prices would vary depending on the different packages so how um i know that there's been um you know problems with the international students 
during the pandemic, uh, especially in Australia. Um, how challenging has has that been for you in you know the past couple of years? Because I, I yeah, extremely <laughs> challenging. I mean, we. Um, when when the, it was first announced, um, the first meeting I went to, I was saying this is a big problem in China. You know, they're, they're, this is going to cause a rift across the whole uh, industry. And, and at that stage, people thought I was sort of just panicking and I wasn't. I just could see the fold out of it being global and being something hard to resurrect. So we took action straight away. We were very early. In, in getting organized for plan B and C and D because students were just stopping, you know, and, and that's what happened. So we, we've been able to survive um, during COVID without really losing our core team. And we're now growing again because the borders are opening. So we're, we're, we're back in business, but a lot of our competitors have disappeared because they didn't survive. Mm -hmm. So we've got a bigger market share. So we're looking forward to a very successful next two years um, just because of who we are and that we've survived. But it, look, it's, very, it's been very tough. We were lucky um, the New South Wales government funded placements of students who were homeless because they didn't have jobs anymore, international students. And we put our hand up and we placed uh, nearly 2,000, I think 1,500 students funded by New South Wales government just to get them off the streets and put them in people's homes. So a little bit like the asylum seeker story, it's the, it's the pandemic result of the students not having enough money to pay rent. So they were, they were living in cars or under people's houses or, wow. and, and we got them into homes. And, and our, once again, our hosts put their hand up and did their job for less than half their normal price. So the government could fund it because it was a very low cost rescue program. Yeah. And we were able to still earn money from that program, you know, to keep us alive. So it, it was just another nice outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, the power of the hosts. The hosts are incredible. So how many hosts do you have on your network? Well, in in the since 2007, we've had 60,000 apply to host in Australia. Like we, we, at any one point in time, we only need five to 10,000 active hosts. So people come and go, they don't do it all the life or all the time, but they might have a break and then come back on. But, but at any one point in time, we have a great selection for the number of students that we place. Um, but we will be looking for more hosts because we think there's going to be a huge influx back into Australia over the next 18 months. And we think there's not as many homestay competitors. And at the same time, homestay is looking much safer and a better value proposition for parents overseas sending their children. So we think we'll have a bigger percentage of students wanting to start with homestay. Uh, not necessarily stay with homestay if they're over 18, but they yeah. should all start. They should all start with homestay. Okay. So I just wanted, um, you know, um, you you do train your uh, hosts, right? Um, the families that host the international students. Um, do you also introduce because you know as you know now boarding uh, my podcast show is about sustainability and about you know eco responsible tourism um do you include any good uh, sustainable practices um as a part of your training for the hosts well let, let, let me say we don't push we don't push it hard but let me just explain that Homestay in its own is about sh the sharing economy. It's about saving us from building more buildings when there are empty rooms everywhere. Um, you know, there are rooms that can be used and we're using them. So we're recycling, um, if you want to put it in, in, in an yeah. eco sense. Yeah. We're sort of saving the economy by recycling rooms that have been empty for years, some of them, and, and just sitting there. And, um, you know, so, so our host generally, um, you know, uh, um, follow their own political directions in all areas, but we won't accept any um, anti-cultural behaviours that would be demeaning or, or, or destroy, you know, relationships with their guests. 
and, and, I, and I think this supply demand um, um, tool that drives us, it's also led us into new areas. Like, I don't know if you've read, but we've just launched Disability Homestay Network in Australia. So oh, this yeah, is... This is that, yeah. Okay, yeah. so this is to, to um, promote short-term accommodation for the disabled. And there's a huge demand for that. And they're, you know, they're usually, um, you know, if there's a respite situation, often the guest, the, the, the participant ends up in an institutional respite um, while their normal care or parents are having a break. In our case, it'll be hosted accommodation and it'll be one-on-one -on -one and it will be using a spare room and we'll be training hosts to, you know, to the certain levels of, um, you know, caring and there'll be support workers um involved as well so we're really excited about that diversion of program as well but but look we we value you know um, our community and our climate and our um, ecotourism but we want students traveling let's make no mistake we think it's great for the world that students come to another country and study meet another family we think it's helping the world in a different way you know and it's, yeah. it's getting getting the world more together and and little things like um it's quite often for our hosts to go to the wedding of their student from four years ago or five years ago and travel overseas yeah. And, and we've even had one host recently um, go back to Japan with the student and have a holiday with the, the real parents of the student so that you've, you're sort of watching all this happen. So it's not about the money. It's, a, it's about the relationship. And mm -hmm. one of our bylines we've used is, is we form lifetime relationships. You know, yeah. that's, what, that's what we do. We don't provide accommodation. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's incidental, right? No, it's I, the incidental <laughs> part. Yeah. yeah, but we've just seen too many great stories, you know, from the connection that we make. Yeah, and and that's been really a valuable um, lesson for everybody. We got surprised by it. We've been surprised by it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's when people really, really, um, they. Um, you know, your expectations are very different from how they actually uh, turn up, right? And turn out, uh, which is, yeah, which is quite, it's, it's all about people at the end of the day, you know? It, it yeah. started as what looked and felt like an accommodation program. Yeah. And it ends up being a global uniting program. You know? <laughs> like it's bringing the world together. One big family. <laughs> one big happy family and, and yeah. people stay in touch. And we, we, I've seen a host with their guest book and they would have like 100 students from their history of hosting, you know, short term, medium term, long term. And they're in, they, they tell me they connect with them still. But they've got this long list of people from countries all over the world that they're in touch with. And if they ever travel, they'll be visiting. Yeah. So yeah. I think, it, yeah, so it works both ways. I mean, it's it's the it's the international students who come to Australia, who stay with these host families. They understand, you know, the local culture and the the essence of it. And similarly, I'm sure this, you know, the the Australians, the locals would also be able to get a glimpse of a different culture uh, from wherever you know the student comes from so Correct. i think yeah so it's just yeah like like it, we and in in terms of saving the planet i think that's saving the planet you know yeah. like that's my yeah. summary is that we're getting a much better cultural understanding and yeah. when we moved in the asylum seeker world we got a better acceptance of the asylum seeker you know coming to australia and, and when we move to Disability Homestay Network, we get a better integration of a disabled person into a local community with new networks. And, and that's all part of the dream. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Wow. I mean, it's incredible uh, the kind of work that, you know, you personally and uh, the Australian Stay Home Network is, is putting together. Um, and it's such an important factor. You know, we all talk about climate change. We talk about um, uh, sustainability. We talk about the the environment being taken care of, the wildlife, all of that. But I think 
people and cultures um, are so much more important to understand and to preserve that, um, you know, you, you're doing some phenomenal work and I wish you all the very best. <laughs> and um, if my daughter was, uh, you know, if, if uh, eventually she's gone to the US to study, but if she had thoughts of coming to Australia, I would have, absolutely uh, <laughs> gotten in touch with you so thank you. thank you so much and i'm definitely going to you know keep um keep myself updated on what is happening at your end and it's just been great talking to you thank you so much david thanks Bail, and congratulations on your show it's fabulous thank you so much thank i you. appreciate it <laughs> all right then bye 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 Hope you enjoyed this episode of Now Boarding, a travel podcast. Check out other episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. And of course, don't forget to share your thoughts with us. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes only on Now Boarding, a travel podcast.